This thread is long as hell. That's why I don't know if someone mentioned this already. There was an old ancient cult, worshipping some kind of god that centered around the idea of in-between. That in-between was mentioned probably as the point in between extremities. The idea was simple. A balance exists, and it must be held, or the world will stop to exist. The power holding the balance in check is this in-between element that was worshipped. In between good and evil, there is a more powerful element controlling these lesser known factors of the universe. Good and evil defined by man is ludicrous because these elements must be pictured as two rivers emptying themselves into each other constantly. One can become the other and vice versa. Thus, the element controlling the waters is the true master of the universe, the father of all, holding his two children from each other's throats, forever holding the balance. The people who worship the in-between element, nameless god, nameless entity, nameless state of existence, and the so-called outsiders, the anomalies of our universe. They are stigmatized by the energies on our planet, and they are tormented, nearly rejected for being ultimately under the gaze of the in-between element. We are very few, and we never meet each other, because it is impossible. Our paths are truly impossible to describe in a human linguistic method. Alas, the in-between element does exist, and it's the element governing over chaos. It speaks with us, with the ones he chose, like a friend would speak with you in a coffee shop. It is truly amazing. Our fate is truly opaque and filled with pain, because we are creatures of pleasure, and we will always seek the need to escape our pain and find pleasure. True knowledge comes through pain. Happiness makes you stupid, and pain convinces you of reality. I'll end on a more amusing idea. This entity is nonchalant and indifferent, opposed to the other two elements who want to govern us. Since these kinds of cults were beyond taboo, they were not chronicled at all. These ideas that we discuss here will alienate the vast majority of readers now, and we exist in the contemporary era. Imagine this kind of ideas in ancient times. Cults like these started, and more than likely survived, around the Carpathian Mountains, where immortality was widely accepted as a norm in most religious context, even if they worshipped different entities. These tribes fell in love with the idea of death, even worshipping the idea of finally meeting the unknown. Thus the fear of the unknown was non-existent. They worshipped the idea of the void. These kinds of ideas gave birth to the warrior code slash honor code that is present in every culture known in history, dying as fast as possible or proving your worth in order to be accepted by the void as a worthy element to transition to the next plane of existence. It is quite interesting. The Gatai people were known of crying when their babies will be born and laughing at funerals. While in combat, warriors would laugh when wounded and sing songs while dying. The mentality of life and death was vastly different then, a complete 180. I am sorry, I cannot give you the exact name of a cult, as I said before. Mostly are legends and ideas that got propagated by the word of mouth. Possibly, the deity getting close to the inspiration of the in-between element would be Zalmoxas, worshipped by the tribes south and north of the Danube River, including the famous Darcians who ruled over Rome at one point. Legends like Lycanthropy and whatnot were common back then. Darcians is a literal name from Latin, which means wolf people. In Latin, Daos means wolf. Darcian, Daos, wolf, wolf person. They fought wars without armor, and said they would growl like beasts and ignore pain, laugh when stabbed, and bite Roman legionnaires by the neck if their weapons would break mid-combat. Even legends of them devouring corpses, but in my opinion, this is a bit far-fetched. There's not much information regarding this structural concept. We associate what we do not understand with the divine, because there are some things in this world so hard to comprehend, we could spend our lives searching for the answers that are minimal at best. Our hunger for answers is eternal. As long as we experience pain and bad scenarios in our life, without a real reason, we will always want to seek a logical explanation. Sadly enough, our world is chaotic at best. In a way, all of us will remember the void, in a way. The small fraction of a memory lost somewhere in the back of your being. The moment before we were born, the happiness of the void that we cannot explain in this world. 
because it is outwardly. Monotheism is a paradox because every so-called monotheistic religion is the antithesis of their god. Thus, in that sequence of logic, there are two gods in every monotheistic cult because humanity always had an unexplained reason to underline and brand opposition. It's the law of our universe. Everything has opposition. The best example is the magnet or the natural elements, aka fire and water, and so on and so forth. With that in mind, everything also has a core. The core is mostly unseen or deemed irrelevant throughout the plane of existence of that certain element. The true divine does not have antithesis, nor does it have a human moral allegiance, because such entity would not be compatible without our plans of existence. It would be above it. That is the whole point of superiority. Thus, a feeble thought process as good or evil would be as irrelevant for the divine as we caring about the ethics of ants. Here is one of two stories from the Emerald Isle of Ireland. My uncle and his buddies are exploring the mountains in Wicklow in the 90s. He's changed some details over the years, so take with a grain of salt. There is absolutely nothing at all in the Wicklow Mountains. Fields and forests, and then more fields, and maybe a shed. Him and his friends just want a quiet place to drink and camp. He is with Tom and Declan. Tom is a skittish, skinny guy, and always has been. Declan is built like a goddamn bear. They find a place, camp with a little barbecue out of their crappy hatchback car. Typical stuff. Tom heads off for a piss in the woods drunk. Uncle and Declan have a laugh for a while, drinking and doing dumb stuff. Half an hour later, Tom has not come back. What? Okay, what the hell? They head off to find him. After wandering around the forest looking for him, my uncle manages to lose Declan and trips halfway down a damn hill in the wet mud. Lands hard on something soft. It's Tom who was staring at my uncle as if he had just took a crap on his grandmother. Tom, what the hell are you- Tom interrupts him with a super slow motion point towards the clearing. Uncle described it as a fucking load of pricks and rubs staring at a fucking rock in the middle of the poxy forest. They are all standing silently still in blue rubs around a tall rock in the middle of the damn mountains. They have not noticed my uncle and Tom yet. The two of them are lying in the mud for nearly 20 minutes in fear. Suddenly, Declan bellows, Lads, where the hell are you, for God's sake? It's freezing. The mob spins around and immediately starts walking towards them. They run like Sonic, the shit-scared hedgehog, back to their camp. Start trying to pack up everything. The mob is walking through the forest towards them. Leave things. In car. Driving. Home. They don't remember anything of the journey. He refuses to go camping now. There were rumors of a cult up there for decades, but that is the only proper sighting. I was taken into foster care when I was very young. I never knew my birth parents. Did not find out I was adopted until my teens. I had a good childhood. My adoptive parents were loving, kind, and gave me a good upbringing. Every now and then, I have a recurring nightmare. Same thing, every time. It's the middle of the day, and I'm out in the woods, lying on my back. I'm surrounded by people. Their faces are covered, so I cannot see them clearly. One of them grabs my head, and forces me to look straight into the sun. Just as my eyes start burning, the sun begins to fade. I am in pitch blackness, but the spot where the sun used to be is still distinguishable. It's in a naturally dark circle. Kind of hard to describe with words. Just an impossibly dark circle. That is when I always wake up, usually covered in sweat and panting. I figured that something bad must have happened to me as a child. Whenever I ask my birth parents about my past, my folks get really uncomfortable, saying that they don't know who they were or how I could even find them. Recently, I went on a massive road trip with a couple of friends. Stop in some dead-end town one night, we're drinking at the campsite when some drunk homeless guy comes wandering in. The guy is off his face. Pretty funny to watch him stumble around and spout random crap. 
Tell him we'll give him a beer, if he can do 20 push-ups. He manages somehow, and I go to give him a beer. He gets a good look at my face, as I hand it to him, and he goes, as white as a damn ghost. Drops the beer, and jumps back. The guy looks terrified. Points at me and yells. This one's seen the black sun. Then runs off. I've never told anyone about the dream, so this scared the crap out of me. So now I feel I should maybe hire a PI or something to look into my parents and childhood. Kinda scared about what I might find though. Used to know a 60 year old ex-aviation engineer in Bozeman. He was a professor in maths before becoming a contractor for the government. Apparently, he learned a ton about physics and material science from some of the other guys he worked with and helped with some calculations and some obscure hydrogen bomb. He once rambled on about how he used to have a shape-shifting car that he'd used to kidnap people in middle America. He'd go around, crash into someone's car, and kidnap them, as his car would be untouched and he would not leave a trace. As he'd drive back to his home, he'd shift the shape of his car numerous times. He also said once how he had a key that could unlock any other door. He demonstrated on a couple of cars, but I just assumed it was a neat party trick. There was another instance where he ranted about different types of networking cables and how difficult it was to set up a surveillance system for his farm that could track human movement. Not too weird, but he said he'd use it for his basement if he could figure it out. He owned about 40 acres and also owned a massive underground private bunker. Creepiest thing I remember about him is that he would always vehemently disagree with the existence of aliens, even for a passive, off-handed comment. He would argue with you that there was nothing in the sky but men. Lost touch with him after I left, but some of the stuff he used to say would get you thinking, but he was probably a regular old man. I remembered a couple actually. He owned a number of clothing that was about twice the size of Double XL. Despite being very stout for his age, if I recall correctly, one of his old friends had gigantism and he kept some of his favorite clothes. I can't exactly remember what he said he did with his car. I want to say it was stolen, but I really cannot remember the details. Small tidbits. He had a gun that had an infinite cartridge. It did not use bullets. Instead, he would scoop up a load of dirt and it shot compressed dirt balls. It seemed ridiculous then. Still kind of does now. He owned cyanide teeth. Individual cyanide tooths. He even popped one in just to show me they fit. Him and another guy had come up with their own secret language. Sounded nothing like any common languages I've ever heard before or since, and he would occasionally write in it. He was a Freemason and actually tried to get me to join, but also told me how all they did all day was shoot the shit and plan donations to schools, so I didn't take him up on his offer. I say regular old man because that's just how he came off to me. An old man with a ton of wisdom and experience, but also a sense of humor and exaggeration to come up with crazy stories to justify his knowledge. Alright, so back in the mid-2000s, my local high school was getting targeted by Teen Challenge. It's a weird Christian help group thing, and has a ton of comments saying that it's a cult, but whatever. My friend joined up since she was kind of a wreck and wanted some help, but was poor enough not to afford a therapist. After her month was up, she came home kind of worse, she told us all about what happened, which I will talk about here. They all arrived at this old Boy Scout camp around noon, after being herded into a bus. Only one bus, since there was only a certain amount of kids allowed into the camp, which was the amount that one bus could hold. The camp gets rented out when Boy Scouts are out on expeditions, or aren't doing the rope bridge thing. I know the place, as I used to be a Boy Scout. About four cabins, two for the boys there, since they thought it was like a camping trip and one for the girls, and next to the girls was the staff. Things are fine for the first week. Just a bunch of go around the circle and say a fact about you staff. Food was mediocre, she said, like school lunch. Snacks were sold separately, and could be earned using good boy points. First Sunday of the group, they go to the outdoor stage or church in the morning. They start preaching about how God hates every single one of them, and that to clean themselves, they needed to become one with the Lord. This involved obeying the staff, 
because they were the cherubs sent from the heavens above. Any resistance to this would be met with going to the shed. The shed was the timeout room, but it was actually a workshop for Boy Scouts, so there's a bunch of saws and tools everywhere. Apparently, the staff coated all of them in fake blood for extra scare factors, but the room stung real bad either way, like copper and uncooked leftover Chinese food. Friend tried not to get sent there a lot, but when she did, there was probably a bunch of guys and the staff banging on the walls, screeching and laughing. She had to join in on one of these mobs because she was ordered to, along with about 15 of her kids. Some were given frying pans, and others were just told to run into the wall and scream loudly. Bonfire chats happened every Sunday and every Wednesday, because Wednesday was a weekly feast day, where they were given actual filling food, but only warm water or warm grape juice. At night, a cabin would randomly be woken up, and forced to prepare something for everyone the next day. They would get an extra hour of sleep, before they were reawakened, with the other cabins, banging on their cabin like shed. Exercises were basically like, carry a cross across the field, and back, or run around the field, with a cross in hand. This went on for about one hour, until they had breakfast, which was usually just toast, and those small butter packets, along with grape juice. Repeat, until they get to lunch, which is just a small square sandwich, with just tuna salad in it, some grapes, and water or grape juice. Dinner was usually something bigger, like a small slice of steak or a fish, which they never knew how they got from out there every Wednesday for a month. A kid broke into the staff's cabin to get his phone to call his parents to get him out and was made to be kept inside the shed for three days, but they forgot to take his phone, so his seven father came out with a shotgun, threatening the staff as he took his kid away. All were called in for a special talk, where they said they were never allowed to leave until they purified themselves at the end of the month. Continue this for a month, until they get to the days leading up to the purification ceremony. All kids are scared as hell. Staff says every day will be a feast day, so at least some will be better off then. They have a small petting zoo that's brought in during the night, filled with goats, like a good seven goats. The activities were just to have fun that last week, as a way to bask in God's greatness. Three days before they were all lined up and given a robe to wear during the ceremony, some fit fine, others didn't even get it on, so were told to sit out and were given normal awful meals until then. Final feast day, some kid says the staff were lining up the goats into the shed with aprons. They slaughtered all of the goats from meat, what the hell. Final day ends at like 10 or midnight. They all get brought out with their robes, onto a special extra-large bonfire and feast. All are meant to shout loudly to the stage, then to the sky, something like, Thank you God, Master of the World, and thank you for your cherubs, before being given their goat to eat with their bare hands. From there on, they were let loose to do whatever, and most seemed kind of crazy that night, staying up until the early morning. Friend hid in the underside of one of the cabin's porches, cold and tired. The staff sit down on the porch, not knowing she's under there, and talk about opening up the church a lot more for the new converts. How much it reeked in the shed, and wondering if it would be dry enough for next time as a joke. Then asking if they had any wine left, but they didn't because the kids were drinking it all. They got pissed, and so they went to the feast area to get some more and come back. She crawled out after a minute or two, and went and sat to sleep like it was nothing. When she woke up, the room was a mess, and the staff, obviously drunk, came in slurring that the horrors needed to clean up. They all cleaned. The boys were already out playing, and a look into the rooms showed it was a mess. They were all given their phones and suitcases in the last hour, lined up at the bus stop, and were told they have to come back to be cleaned again. Went up to the place a year or two ago with her and a friend of mine, who used to be a boy scout, because she wanted to see if anything was still happening there. The cabins and stage were really run down. The spot where the shed was, was burnt and covered up. Wine, fear tactics, preying on children, cleansing, as if you were somehow naturally wrong or unclean. Cherubs, stations of the cross. Yeah, nah, pretty sure they're either messed up Christians or Satanists of some kind. That OP here. Didn't realize until you said that they were probably doing the stations of the cross with that field stuff. 
I'll ask her if she has any more details, though I don't know if she'll be too keen on giving more, since it was a really bad time for her. Okay, here's what she said. Staff's cabin had a few guns in it, from what I could said, like hunting rifles for small to large game. The backside of the girl's cabin reeked of rotten eggs. Behind it showed there was a small lock cellar, and that all the cabins had one like this that were all locked. Others did not smell bad. Staff were horrible to female attendees, usually just being demeaning phrases or chores for the camp, but sometimes slurs and vulgarity, like with the original post. Upon entering the cabin for the women, the cross was upside down. Before the kids would leave in the morning, they would need to take off the robe, but since many didn't before they fell asleep, the staff began ripping it off by hand, and according to her friend, by a knife sometimes. The camp currently is not allowed to be accessed due to the local police having to investigate a large group of homeless people who moved in, and whether or not to just let them be, since no one owns the land anymore. Also, road to the camp was closed for a solid few months to a year because of safety concerns. Still don't know if it's still closed or not actually. Staff at the camp were just brought in out of town for the camp, and all of them looked scruffy to a point where it looked like they cleaned up, but not well. That reminds me, they showered in a weird staff bathhouse thing, one for each gender, and the staff would use it when the kids were in there. The staff never used their actual names, and instead just called themselves Mr. or Miss. A day that it rained, all of the kids were brought out into the rain, and were told to light a fire so that they could all get warm. No one was able to light a fire, and all were scolded. Art was banned outside of designated art zones on the sides of the cabins, and even then they were small. Only Christian religious paintings were allowed. Bible readings would skip the parts of paganism that made it look bad. I'll post more tomorrow. Tired now. This does not even sound like paganism. This sounds more along the lines of satanic or otherwise cult-like practices. Why would a cellar smell like rotten eggs? Sulfur? I doubt they were storing a ton of eggs there. My guess is mold and rotting items, bugs, and all other things associated with decomposition. I just looked it up, and sulfur smells coming from a basement could indicate a broken sewer line or a natural gas leak, which is dangerous. A quote from this link, hydrogen sulfide is dangerous, even at low levels. Prolonged exposure to sewer gas can cause irritability, headaches, fatigue, sinus infections, bronchitis, pneumonia, loss of appetite, poor memory, and dizziness. The Scottish plumber says, it affects people and pets that are exposed to it over a long period of time. In that case, no wonder the people running the place were batshit crazy. A nun's friend is lucky that she did not get detonated. Me and two of her bros camping in the woods of the Pacific Northwest about a year ago. It was a weekend that was supposed to relieve us of our stress. A weekend to drink, wheel, shoot, and have fun like no other. Anyway, we decide to go down this old ass logging road and go to a camping spot. Get stuck and get lost multiple times, trying to find my buddy's perfect spot. Get there about the six or seven. We get a fire going and start roasting some hot dogs, cause hey, we are damn hungry. Just about to open up some brews when we hear the sound of vehicles. Lots of vehicles. I look at my friend John and say, Hey, you were leading. Did you see any of our vehicles out here? Looks at me and shakes his head. Okay, what else? Anyway, eating our dogs and drinking our brews, having a merry old time. Getting cold out, so we douse the fire and start to hit the hay. My friend Nate sleeps outside his Tacoma, freezing his ass off in a mummy sleeping bag. Me and John hit the hay in our truck's cabs. Morning rolls around, and we get to starting the fire again. Nate looks at both of us and says, Did you guys hear anything last night? Like, screaming. I'm thinking, what the hell is he talking about? Me and John laugh, and we're like, Knock that stuff off, man. It ain't funny. Nate is like, Nah, guys. I for sure heard screaming at about 11 o'clock last night. Me and John look at each other and look at Nate. I say, Dude, don't joke about that stuff, man. It's weird and creepy. Nate just shakes his head, and I can for sure tell he's freaked out. John speaks up and says, Well, boys, if we're gonna be in a screaming wood, might as well be armed, right? 
Me and Nate laugh and are like, yeah, get out the arsenal. We get a count. Among us, we had two shotguns, a pistol, an FN foul, SKS, and an AR. We're acting like hot shit, because we think we're protected from the screaming. Anyways, we go about our day, shooting stuff, and wheeling with drinking in between. Fun is held there, but when we get back to camp, the mood changes. We all drive on it, and stuff is raided. We dismount and take stock. Nate's sleeping bag is gone, and our lamps are gone. Food is strewn everywhere, but not taken, mind you. What the hell did they want? What made us really shit bricks was sitting by a tree. A dead, gutted, and mutilated deer, and the tree it was sitting by had a pentagram drawn in blood. That feel when you get churns, and there's that somber thought that you know you're not welcome out here. We sobered up real quick. Nate's like, we need to get the hell out of here, man. Me and John are like, screw that. We are staying, bro. He is on the verge of crying, and we're like, bruh, don't be a pussy. Starts yelling at us that we are crazy and should leave. We look at him and say, dude, if you want to leave, just leave. He does, roars the hell out of there in his truck. We should have left, but my god, we were cocky. Night rolls around, and we start a fire again. We sit loaded and ready to go. Whatever the hell is out here can come and damn well get us. I sit facing out towards the forest from the fire, FAL in hands. John does the same with his SKS. We're talking back and forth when all of a sudden we hear the screaming as well. The moment the screaming started, the woods got real damn quiet. Not even a cricket was chirping. It dawned on us that this was no animal. It was a human scream, a girl. Once in a while, the screaming would die down and you would hear chanting. Cultists for sure and from the pentagram, we are dealing with Satanists. Now I know you're thinking, why the hell didn't we get out of there, just like Nate did? Simple answer, me and John are idiots. Trust me when I say this, it was a looning experience, and now, well, we're not as cocky, anyway. John pats me on the back and I jump. What do you want, man? Look, bro, he says, as he turns ghost white. Through the trees and the foliage, we see light from what looks to be a bonfire. Me and John the twits. We doused our fire and headed in the direction of the other one. We creep through the woods and come to an old landing. We see a group of 30 plus gathered around this massive fire. Women, children, old people, and some men dressed in crimson robes on only what can be described as a stone. Later girl, looked to be about 18, skinny and blonde, screaming the whole while to these people to let her go. She was writhing and crying on it. Lo and behold, out comes an old man, dressed in robes of dark black. Seemed like they just absorbed the light itself, but in his hand was a knife. Now I'm shitting bricks at this point. Muscles feel like jelly, and I just want to run. Go back to town, and forget we saw anything at all. I whisper to John, let's get out of here, man. I start tugging on his shoulder to go, when he waves me off and points to the old guy. The guy now has the knife fully raised above his head and is yelling gibberish. John looks at me and says, Back me up, okay? What the actual hell, bro? John steps out of the woods and cracks off a shot over the head of the men in black. Every single head whips around to look straight at me and him. They start screaming at us and coming slowly at me and John. I crack off a shot over the head of some dude in crimson. The mob stops and the dude in black comes to the front. In the most guttural, inhuman voice, these two will do. The man is flanked by the guys in crimson now. They are all brandishing weapons now, and start inching closer. John pops off for never shot. The man in black says, No one is here to help you now, I hope you know that, and smiles. I'm gonna call him Black Robes from now on. Now I'm saying, he has a Joker-esque smile, ear to ear. John yells something to the effect of stay the hell away, and time seems to slow down at this point. John's SKS barks, Ron flies through the air, and hits black robes in the legs. Dude hits the ground screaming. Crimson guys hesitate as they see their leader fall, start advancing again. I put a round through one of their shoulders, and he hits the dirt. Dude's hoods come down as he hits. Dude is a fatty. John screams, stay the hell back. Guy stops, 
They look visibly shaken, as we have a good old Mexican standoff. Redhead in black robes are screaming for help now. The kid Satanists are wailing. A line of women is standing behind the crimson guy, screaming at us. My body is flooded with adrenaline at this point. Let's rock and roll, I'm thinking. Screaming, crying, and mewling of children is all that I hear. Something breaks to the fore of it all. Sirens. Sirens out here. John and I are yelling at these people to stay the hell back and release the girl. The red host starts inching forward again. John looks at me, and I hear him clear as day say, shoot to wound. He takes a step forward and pops a crimson guy in the chest and takes some girl in the leg. I follow alongside him, FN foul barking as I either shoot for legs or shoulders. Lights everywhere, screaming. Everything goes black as I get tackled by a cop. Wake up handcuffed next to a cop car. Look to my right and see John. Smiles back at me and says, we saved a bro. Look into the field and see people getting ferried out of there and into ambulances or cop cars. Blonde is escorted into a cop car. One face is no test. Out of them all, however, it's Nate. Cops follow him as he walks up to us. Yeah, these were the other two I was telling you about. Cops nod and place us in separate cars. Go back to town. Now this is where the story ends. We essentially got off scot-free thanks to the blonde's testimonial. Nate's testimonial helped out our case as well. Actually, the whole town practically came to our defense, seeing as this was actually a frequent thing up in those hills. Apparently, a lot of people have seen the stuff these people do, and didn't fess up to it until then. By the way, if it helps, I still have that FN file, and my god, I am not getting rid of it.